yeah, I'll talk about uh, distributed trust and about blockchains and about hyperledger fabric. Um, to start today, I don't really know your background so much, but I heard a lot of people know how Bitcoin works. A lot of people are already familiar with blockchain and uh, the, the startup scene and all these, these proposals for protocols. So I thought before we talk more about hyperledger fabric and the protocols we understand better, we also talk a bit about how to build such blockchain systems, yeah? But before we talk about building blockchain systems, how do we build a bridge? Because, or how do we, do we build an airplane? We have all traveled over bridges uh, and depended with our lives on the bridges to be stable. And engineering of bridges has a long history and it generally consists of two uh, ways to build things. Empirical validation, you build something, you see how it does, and then you maybe sometimes see the catastrophic uh, events like this Tacoma Narrows Bridge that everybody should see once on YouTube at least <laughs> before they build a blockchain system <laughs> because those engineers, they thought they had it right. Yeah? <laughs> they had not thought of the, uh, uh, the vibrations. And analytical design, of course. You have a theory that uh, tells you how you build such a system. And uh, many other parts of our modern technology of science and how we benefit as, as humans from technology have gone through such uh, evolutions. For example, medicine. For a long time, people were just doing what made sense in the past, like empirically, because they didn't really understand what goes on in the body and so on. And nowadays, with a lot of research into biotechnology, also with this, this fantastic discoveries about how life works, how biology works, we understand a lot more, but at the end of the day, uh, is, is a combination between analytical design discoveries and empirical validation that we also need in medicine. Now, whenever there is a boom in some, in some technology or in some science, there are also people who are often uh, pretending more than what actually can be done. And in medicine, there was a very clear time in the second half of the 19th century before medicine was regulated, when a lot of people were selling snake oil as a cure for everything. So snake oil is a cure all, you know, something that somebody just tells you, take this. And I guess from the times of our grandparents, and at least mine, they, were all, they all had their secret little, little recipe without any scientific uh, background of why this works. And um, medicine has clearly come beyond this, such that nowadays if you want to use some medicine, if you want to trust your life onto something like this, then you are going to the established experts and you see what uh, they recommend you because they have reached agreement or consensus on what makes sense. Um, coming a bit closer to our field, cryptography. Cryptography has been uh, a dark, no, it has been done in the dark, in the black chambers yeah, of governments for centuries. There was no open debate about cryptography whatsoever, no, not much understanding until the mid 70s with the discovery of uh, public key cryptography and Diffie Hellman. Today it's modern science. We have those uh, textbooks here. We have AES, for example, that's a block cipher that has been validated by a committee. And not only by a committee, by the worldwide group of experts designing such protocols and trying to shoot holes into other people's protocols. And we have organizations that run research on these like uh, cryptography research conferences. So that's how we build the uh, crypto systems nowadays. But I'd like to remind you that there was a time when also crypto systems were into snake oil, were, were, were um, vulnerable to snake oil claims. Because here is a website from the 90s, 1998, if you can read the date on the left, the signs of, uh, warning signs of crypto snake oil, because there was a boom and a lot of people uh, pre just pretended they had a, a most secure crypto system, some startup somewhere, and it was as secure as the one-time pad, but of course with short keys. And if you remember something about your crypto 101 class, which you should have taken if you are want, <laughs> or you might have taken, then this cannot be done in the same sense. And Bruce Schneier started a very uh, influential blog and gained popularity by just exposing a lot of such uh, crypto 
snake oil schemes in the 90s and uh, how do we design the blockchain nowadays yeah now this is definitely the case where we are again in the hype times we're in the boom times and there are a lot of uh, schemes being proposed without analytical evidence for their uh, security guarantees and also without empirical validation yeah so i just listed two things here do you develop your own cryptography and those who are into the business they know exactly which blockchain i wanted to point fingers to um, do you do you develop your own consensus protocols well a lot of them do as well and there is currently a need for doing a lot of research on this um, there is very little agreement among experts on which protocols have which guarantees. This is from an analyt analytical viewpoint. And now come the Satoshi enthusiasts, and they will say, of course, well, Satoshi didn't have a proof either. So why does Bitcoin work? Yeah? Of course, well, I would say then uh, Bitcoin works because it's shown empirically that it actually works. Yeah? And, uh, but it's not that uh, people would have trusted their money onto Bitcoin before they would have seen that it works. So in that sense, it's an empirical design, an empirical validation. But when we approach now new designs, when we want to reach this, uh, this goal of uh, having a, a very scalable consensus protocols with a lot of guarantees, then unfortunately, a lot of people forget the ideas that we have research, learned in literature. I want to show this to you as well. Um, this is a great book by Martin Kleppmann on designing data intensive applications. And each chapter has a picture and this is the consensus chapter. So you have different uh, mountains in this, in this island here. One is titled linearizability, another is titled total load broadcast. And here in the front here, you see the wrecks of homegrown consensus algorithms. <laughs> And that's just a very good way to, to illustrate uh, what can go wrong. Yeah, but the point I wanted to make is here, if you develop a blockchain system, you should look at established practice from engineering, from designing crypto systems, because blockchain systems are a lot like crypto systems. You don't know that they fail until they actually fail, yeah? Um, because somebody points out the attack and then it's gone. All the things are gone. But you can never be sure that the system is secure by just demonstrating the system on a, uh, in, in an environment where there is no attacks. Yeah? So you have to expose the system to the real world and you have to be facing attackers that try to attack your system or you have to come with some security proofs and some assumptions, but whenever you make an assumption, that's a vulnerability that somebody can again circumvent that you might not have uh, thought about, yeah. And just the, the one thing here, the quote from Schneiders, this blog post in the 90s was that the problem with good, with bad security is that it looks just like good security. You can only tell the difference by looking inside and also by the expert agreement. So that's the mission with which I wanted to open here, just to say why in the blockchain platform Hyperledger Fabric on which we work, we don't have a fancy consensus algorithm. We took things that are very well known, yeah? And, and just to round this off, there's a report also that we published where we looked at several of those uh, permissioned or consortium blockchains where uh, looking at some of the claims they make and what can be proved and what cannot be proved. So the only thing you have to remember here is the blue line or the title blockchain consensus protocols in the wild. Yeah, and I may be returning to well, you know what a blockchain is, but uh, <laughs> returning to the, the, the topic that uh, Ali brought up before, um, a blockchain is essentially about distributing trust over the internet. And I show this paper here from 2001 because it's, it has the right title. It doesn't have the right solution. It's not my best paper from, from, the, from the time. Um, but it addresses this research uh, theme that was uh, also what uh, Alison said, the research theme to build systems that are wide area, resilient, uh, that was common around the year 2000. Castro Riskov was an example, and we did independently systems that we were of a similar kind, addressing wide area replication for fault tolerant, secure services uh, over a wide area network. 
So given this past here, I'm going to skip the ledger data structure because I think we've seen the picture before. And um, but just just that's all these ledgers together, right? They all have to be synchronized with each other. And since I understand that you already know what a blockchain is, I can go very quickly and just say what blockchain does. It would synchronize all these ledgers to one emulated virtual ledger that everybody can tap into. So in a, in a sense, it is state maintained in a distributed system where you have potentially malicious adversarial nodes inside the system trying to work against the goals of the system or maybe trying to work against the goals of others who also participate in the system. And so that's uh, the goal of a blockchain. Now, let me talk a bit about uh, consensus in the blockchain world. There are, of course, many ways to do consensus. And in the blockchain world, there are essentially two families of protocols or models and corresponding protocols that are very, uh, that are most prominent. And the one is the so-called permissionless protocol family where everybody can join. It's a peer-to-peer -peer system. You don't need to, uh, you don't need an identity that defines you in a way that could be censored again. And so the vision of uh, the Bitcoin creators, and they were the ones who came up with this, building on many systems like peer-to-peer -peer systems and uh, sort of a bit of cypherpunk, uh, anarchistic uh, or uh, libertarian ideas, was that you don't want to have any element in the system that could where somebody could turn it off. Yeah? So it just should, as long as people are interested in this, it should remain and run. And since you cannot do traditional voting type protocols, you cannot vote by saying I vote yes or I vote no because everybody can join and so millions of copies of myself or Sybils as they're called can also join and vote. That's why you voted with CPU power and that's why we have these protocols based on uh, proof of work, of this so-called proof of work. So we vote by investing CPU power. And these are now these protocols that are in worldwide operation every day for years. Bitcoin protocol alone consumes more energy than Switzerland, according to certain estimations here at the bottom, I listed them, because you can put a lower bound in terms of energy cost and uh, the Bitcoin price that, uh, no, the, the lower bound is in terms of the, the CPU cycles that would need it, need it or ASIC cycles and the upper bound would be the price that you get for the Bitcoins when you, when you get them. But these protocols essentially, they're great because they are scalable to thousands of nodes. You can run them across the whole internet. In theory, there would be thousands of nodes. In practice, I hear there are maybe a dozen or two dozen so-called mining pools where there's an, an amount of centralization again uh, introduced, a lot of centralization in that sense, because these mining pools are the ones that actually dictate then what they propose for a consensus. Yeah? Because in a consensus, you have to propose something and the whole group will agree that this is right in a certain way. Um, the other protocol of these, the other issue with these protocols is their latency. The protocols, first of all, um, they don't reach instantaneous consensus. So the consensus is not final. If a node tells you this is the decision, uh, the node might have erred and you'll have to revert this decision again later. And the probability that you have to revert becomes smaller and smaller as time grows, but it also means that you have to wait a long time if you want to be really sure that this is uh, the decision of the consensus protocol. And there's a risk that is taken, there's a cost that is associated with this, and that's traditionally taken in in cryptocurrencies, this is absorbed by the exchanges. Yeah? If, if somebody gives me, uh, pays out some real euros for, for my Bitcoin, then they want to be sure that this is actually in there. Or if somebody gives me euros for my Bitcoin gold, which is a different story what this is, but some of you might know what Bitcoin gold is, then you might even wait longer because Bitcoin gold is not such a strong cryptocurrency as 
Bitcoin itself is, yeah, because e essentially there was an attack on this recently where people um, reverted this blockchain up to some time. So, yeah, and the big problem, of course, the big, the other big problem that we see, especially from environments where we are okay with having identities, is that the proof of work is just a lot of uh, waste of power, a waste of energy that is invested into this. Yeah, so there is an alternative, and these are the sort of consortium blockchains protocol, the blockchains or the consortium consensus protocols. They are built using the traditional literature from distributed computing, from distributed cryptography, where we know who the nodes are. So we have clearly identified a set of nodes here. It doesn't have to be the same group of nodes for each application, of course. It also doesn't mean that there is one guy who says, you are the nodes. It's more like a consortium or an association or a, a group of people who agree once that they would like to work together and they set some rules for themselves to work together. And then once they have bootstrapped the system like this, they can evolve according to those rules that they have given themselves. So that means they can operate by voting on who is allowed to join the system or who will be expelled because he, he or she was against the, the system and so on. But these type of protocols have been studied for decades uh, since the work of Lampert and maybe even earlier, but Lampert was the one that created this uh, famous term of Byzantine agreement, Byzantine generals, with a very descriptive story to uh, make it very clear to everyone um, what these protocols were supposed to do. And so there are piles of research papers on this topic, and this is indeed what one can benefit from if one works in this mode. Yeah, and and, and even even uh, as, I, as I listed there, there are a lot of variations of this model. So you, as I said, you can grow the group, you can change the group, you can change the protocol also. And there have been some protocol, some blockchain system recently whose only claim to fame was that they had a government's me governance mechanism. It wasn't really implemented so well, actually, I have to say. But here, there's a blueprint in this literature through which you can implement. Uh, we would know already how to implement the governance mechanism to upgrade a system like this, to change the group's nodes, to change the rules, and so on. And the other thing is that you might have heard of protocols, so-called proof of stake, where your voting power is proportional to some coins you have, or proportional to, to some other kind of influence, or maybe to some down payments that you can lose if you are misbehaving. And all such ideas you can realize as well in this idea, in this model. And you would even benefit from having proofs that tell you how these uh, things work. So um, this is indeed related to the history of BFT consensus protocols, what I already mentioned. Starting in the 80s with the Byzantine generals, there were a lot of uh, theory results, uh, but no implementations whatsoever. A lot of theory, lots of theory. So nobody was really interested in the implementation of this, except in the late... Um, in the late 90s, some systems came up that realized a special case of those protocols, namely the case where these protocols tolerated crashes. The most famous example of this family of protocols is Paxos, also by Lampert, also with a story. But a very related protocol that was actually uh, contemporary to Paxos is this u stamped replication from Liskov and, and Oki at MIT. So these systems have been implemented in cloud providers. And when Anderson mentioned earlier that cloud providers were not interested in BFT, they were actually very interested in those kind of systems because those uh, crash tolerant consensus systems are in operation daily at all the major cloud providers and keep those infrastructures synchronized because in a big system, you always have some nodes that are too slow, that are crashed or faulty. But there was no adversary inside. Then in about from about the year 2000 until 2010, there were a lot of research papers and research prototypes in the BFT world, in the Byzantine fault tolerance uh, model, where people following the Castro-Liskov paper from 99, P 
PBFD, the, the practical Byzantine fault tolerance, showed that, well, there's a prototype. You can actually build something that's even fast. And those systems, they, uh, they were left as research system, yeah? The research in, in, in Allison's uh, 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 pyramid where it goes up from the research prototype, many of them did not even implement the hard case, the so-called view change when things turn a bit bad. And so there was no production software. That means also there was nothing implemented in production. And then, um, except for the, for the, for the leading uh, research team in, in Lisbon here <laughs> building BFD Smart, there was no such system being built either in the 2010 times, apart from when the blockchain revolution came along, when the blockchain interest surged suddenly in around 2015, after already the, the Bitcoin had gained some traction and people had started to understand that the proof of work type consensus protocols were maybe not the most economical idea for the consortium and more business type applications. Only then, a lot of interest had come back, has come back since then to so-called BFT consensus protocols in the blockchain world. And now uh, I could go on a uh, list, a long list of uh, such protocols that are being implemented. That's how I should put, uh, I should put it. Um, a few of them are also in operation. And yeah, here is the picture of the textbook that uh, Ali uh, just mentioned. Um, yeah, so BFT consensus, as should be clear by now, it's much better understood. It's very well understood, actually, from the theoretical perspective. It's also well understood from a practical perspective, but not so much from an empirical perspective as running it over a wide area system over a long time. This is what we're just into it now. It's faster, much faster, of course, than uh, Bitcoin-type uh, proof-of-work consensus because there is no, uh, because the, the decisions are always final, so you don't have to wait a certain time for, for these decisions to become final. So the latency is much uh, lower. And uh, the issue is, as was also clear to many, that in a system with n nodes, you need on the order of n squared communication. And that means it's infeasible to run this among thousands of nodes. But with groups of 50 or 100, it seems feasible. But again, this is not yet validated in practice. There are groups of, of uh, size, maybe 20 or so, that are running uh, more or less in practice. And then it, the, the, the feature, the, the most important feature is the permissioned uh, nature, that it needs the identities of the nodes. This can be a feature or can be a problem. If you are, into, uh, if you are interested in something where nobody is identifiable, of course it's a problem. If you are in, interested in more controlled applications, it's a feature that you know who has the power to have influence in the protocol. Okay, that's uh, so much about, about consensus protocols. Now let's turn a bit to Hyperledger Fabric. Hyperledger Fabric is part of the Hyperledger project. So I'll start with the Hyperledger project. Hyperledger itself is basically, and it has an interesting story behind the name, but maybe you have not, we don't have the time for this. <laughs> but basically the Hyperledger project, so no, Hyperledger without project. Hyperledger is a project of the Linux Foundation. That's how maybe it's called formally. The Linux Foundation is probably the biggest open source organization worldwide. Certainly, Hyperledger is the biggest such group in th within the Linux Foundation. It was uh, started in 2016, late, uh, late 15, uh, early 2016, on the initiative of a few major players in the enterprise blockchain world, or players who entered the consortium blockchain world at the time, among them IBM and also Digital Asset Holdings. And uh, the name actually came from a yet another platform that was a startup, the name Hyperledger was a startup bought, uh, originally bought by Digital Asset, and then Digital Asset brought in the name Hyperledger to the project. So Hyperledger itself is this collaboration, and a lot of companies are member of this. Now it's about 200 or more. Um, there are several technologies in there. There's not only the Hyperledger blockchain. There are multiple such blockchains within Hyperledger, but I'm mostly talking about Hyperledger Fabric, which is the most 
prominent among them and also the one that was initially started by IBM, of course. <laughs> and also we started to develop this uh, about three years ago uh, in multiple locations in IBM according to those design principles that I mentioned at the, in, uh, at the start. So today Hyperledger as a project has five different so-called frameworks at the upper layer here. Actually, at the top you see the Linux Foundation and its other projects such as Cloud Foundry or Node.js and things like this. But five frameworks and Hyperledger Saw Tools as another ledger platform for running smart contracts. That's mainly pushed by Intel. And there is Hyperledger IROHA, which is another uh, smart contract platform patterned after an early version of uh, Fabric, actually. And there is the Indy, which is an identity framework for uh, blockchain identity. It includes, again, another BFT algorithm, but it's again, again a platform by itself. Um, but for, that, uh, for identity of, of decentralized identity, that's the project within the Hyperledger uh, umbrella. And there is a, a couple of tools here of five listed. I think there might even be more that are tools that support the running or the comparison or e exchange across these uh, different frameworks. Now it's also, of course, we have to realize that there's not just one blockchain, that maybe even too many in the sense that they are not so compatible with each other. But that's an evolving process. That's also what uh, the goal should be to have a common view eventually. Here are the companies they're a member of. That doesn't make sense. So let's look at Hyperledger Fabric. Hyperledger Fabric is uh, an enterprise blockchain platform intended to be used for applications uh, between businesses. Yeah. So the primary use case are consortia, some group of companies that so far had to form their own legal identity, legal entity to mediate among each other. This uh, entity, this mediator, would be re replaced by the technology, would be replaced by a platform like this. And so it's not a coincidence that the first uh, customers that build prototypes and with IBM or with others using Fabric are this type of company that are today a mediator among other companies. So like exchanges or... or um, we have projects, I think, with DTCC. This is the entity that holds the, sh the stock or the, 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 the paper certificates uh, for the stocks traded in the US. And so it's actually a very interesting feature to be in the, in the museum here, in the house here, where I understand this was founded by somebody who collected banknotes and uh, paper money. <laughs> uh, because I only read this this morning on Wikipedia. <laughs> but... Uh, that's the goal to replace some of these paper money holding processes with technology like this, with hash functions, with consensus protocols, and so on. Anyway, so let's go a bit technical again. Hyperledger Fabric is uh, this platform that allows to run your smart contracts written in the Go programming language, but other languages are possible because the interface between your smart contract and the rest of the world are a set of gRPC web service calls essentially. There is no programming language bindings. So there are already different programming language environments being developed. They're not all in production, but Java and something else is available. Initially, this was this, this fabric was code developed at IBM, but then donated to the Hyperledger project uh, uh, about three years ago or two and a half years ago. And there is a research paper that we recently published uh, by the conference that happened to take place in Porto called Eurosys, uh, describing this architecture. And the architecture is indeed a bit different from what people were studying in the past in these replicated Byzantine fault tolerance systems. Because in the traditional architecture, the one that is in most textbooks, you would go about like this. And this is the pattern that has been there from the 90s onwards in a famous uh, survey written up by Fred Schneider. So you, in order to keep these different replicas that are just communicating with each other, in order to keep these synchronized when they update their state, states that they hold here locally, you would need this so-called consensus protocol. 
And the consensus protocol produces a stream of updates to each node. Its interface is this stream of updates or transactions that change the state. And the consensus protocol makes sure that each node in the system gets exactly the same stream of updates in the same, all the, all, all the updates in the same order. And so that's how the blueprint of the system looks like. They first would run this consensus protocol, which we called also atomic broadcast. And they, there comes the stream of operations or transactions. And these operations must be deterministic because I'm, I'm going to apply this operation for myself without talking to anybody else. So if we have a chance to diverge in the application of the operation, this is not good. This is actually the death of your blockchain in this model. So it must be deterministic. And then we update the state in this deterministic way, and that's why the state remains the same for each and every one. That is also the way that the early versions of hyperlect hyperledger fabric worked. We had this consensus protocol, atomic broadcast with a PBFD implementation, sorting the requests, ordering the requests, and then we had independent deterministic executions. And if you think about determinism in programming languages, that's a difficult beast. Certainly because we would allow here anyone to program in their general purpose favorite language, which could be Go, but could also be another one. But we had this built in, um, we had this left there for flexibility. And so here's the picture how this looks like because every node here, every peer, how we call them, would run the same smart contracts. The smart contracts are the colored things here. So the green one runs on all nodes, all the nodes execute the code. And there's this thing at the top, which is the federated uh, security provider, if you want to say, the one that gives uh, certificates, yeah. But uh, we faced some issues with this uh, paradigm, with this system. We realized that it was damn hard for everybody to program deterministic code. Because even if they knew how to avoid calling def random and getting some randomness, because that would obviously be non-deterministic, they programmed in the language things like an iterator over a complicated data structure, which turned out to be not deterministic because the language platform, the runtime platform, did something different here from there. And then we would get a call and said consensus protocol is broken. And every time we looked into this, we found out that there was some non-determinism in their application. And because the logs of the consensus were always, yeah, they're doing the same, but they were apparently interpreted differently under different replicas. And this determinism in the language is indeed an issue because we did not want to have a domain-specific language. Of course, you can try to develop your own language for your, lang for your blockchain application, then people will have to re reprogram their things in this language, and they also have to understand what this language semantic means, which is the best case for a platform that does it, takes this route, is Ethereum. Yeah? And now there's a big market for people trying to formally verify Ethereum contracts because this language is apparently very difficult to understand. Yeah? Especially if you write that the code is the contract, and then you have a bug in the code, which other people say it's a feature, yeah, because it's actually, you said it's the thing, yeah. This is two years ago with the DAO that uh, was, uh, became a bit uh, prominent for it. That's the determinism that can be an issue in this replication architecture in this one here, right? In this, where everybody replicates. But this architecture also has other issues, namely in terms of scalability. All these executions here take place on each node. So if your smart contract takes 10 milliseconds to execute a transaction, your, your transactions throughput is 100 transactions and not more because you can't be faster, period. And that's what also we heard. We heard, well, it's too slow. Okay, but how long is your, oh, it's, it's too long. How should you go faster, right? This doesn't work. Um, and also the, the f there's no flexibility in, in specifying who is more responsible, who is responsible for a certain application in the sense of that not everybody should run the same application. And that's why this architecture was changed to a different one for Fabric version one. And this is what I'm showing you now. So in Fabric version one, maybe I'll start with the second picture here. In Fabric version one, we broke up this uniformity, this homogeneity, such that you can deploy 
the green smart contract on certain nodes that you as a creator of the smart contract declare to be validator nodes or relevant nodes for the green smart contract. Or the blue one is running on those nodes over there, but this does not have to be each and every node in the system. We would still synchronize the state across all different peers because the state is the same at all peers, but not the execution. So how is this turned from, how do we turn the execution into this static state? And that's what's explained in this picture here. So initially a peer, sorry, a client would not send this transaction to all the nodes in the system, but only to those relevant, designed or designated for running this smart contract, the green ones. And they would execute the smart contract transaction recording its um, its effects, yeah? But they would emulate the execution or simulate the, the execution on the current state in a sort of a slightly speculative way, not committing the updates to the disk yet, not committing the updates to the ledger state, only recording what it would have to be changed. And this is a concept very well known from databases where this would be called a read-write set. Basically, you write down which state entries this uh, execution was depending on and which new state entries it produced. And you put a, a version number there that you get from the blockchain. And then you turn this, so then, then you have turned this uh, transaction from the dynamic thing into a static thing because what comes out is a, a static representation of which variables change according to which dependencies and the peers will sign this according to some policy that has to be defined as well. And then what the ordering consensus engine does is simply broadcast such static read-write sets. And then what comes out of this is something that is very simple to validate. And this validation now is only for checking the conflicts, for the read-write conflicts. So that if you try to spend the same coin still, twice, this could still happen, that somebody tries to spend the same coin here in these different ways, this would be filtered out in the validation step when the sequence of such read-write set transactions comes out. And the application of this now on all peers is faster, so we are not suffering from the throughput limitation here that we had in the other way. And you can also understand this model in a way as a middleware to replicate a database because the same pattern had been used before earlier in, in literature to replicate databases that tolerated crashes. But this is now a BFT version to, to replicate this. So that's how Fabric one, version one transactions would look, uh, would work, and that's how they would look like. Um, I am introducing here also uh, this, so these ordering service nodes at the bottom. These are the ones that actually implement consensus in the sense, in a technical sense of atomic broadcast. But now we have separated consensus into multiple different orthogonal aspects. One is the validity correctness that is ensured by the smart contract executors. And the second one is the consistency that is ensured by the, the ordering service itself. And for scalability, there is also a gossip layer in between such that you can uh, broadcast and disseminate these updates in a more scalable way than with point-to-point -point communications. Yeah. So there's a lot of details here that I talked about, so I'm going to skip about this, but Kemi et al. is the reference to the replicated database work that uh, I mentioned. And so here are uh, the, typical, the different implementations of consensus that are currently available and uh, discussed about for, for Fabric. So the first one is called the solo orderer, which is one central host, which is used for development and specification. And if you are into developing uh, cryptographic protocols, then you also know that this is known there as the ideal functionality, or I guess uh, it was called the abstract data type before. It's like a sequential specification of what happens. If you implement this on one node, you're always the fastest. But then the current production version is a crash tolerant system called Apache Kafka. It's a pops up system that also uh, provides atomic broadcast, but tolerating only crashes within the cluster node, within the uh, no, uh, ordering service nodes. And there is the prototype uh, 
using BFD Smart that Alison described earlier. That's a research prototype that has been uh, developed here, actually. And there is uh, a BFT implementation we call Simple BFT that we are currently lifting from the version 0 0.5 to the version 1 and also improving to building it. So that's the current consensus options that you have in Fabric. And now if you think back of how these other blockchain systems would look like when everybody runs consensus with each other, it is of course possible to configure this infrastructure in a way where each participant has one of these ordering nodes and uh, runs every smart contract and when the endorsement way is specified that you need a majority or uh, more than your a number of faulty participants. So you can get the traditional benefits, but you can also be more flexible. Here is a benchmark from that research paper about a coin that we called Fabcoin or Fabricoin. And that's basically the UTXO model from Bitcoin where we are sorting the, where we're running the transactions through the Kafka cluster. But Kafka or the ordering by itself is, is not the bottleneck at all. It's the pr local processing of these uh, transactions. And so you can see here we get about 3,000 transactions and the lines that slightly decrease here with, with uh, 60 or 100 peers, these are over a wide area network across different continents. What I skipped here is that when I talk to researchers, that all this is production code. Yeah? It's not the research prototype itself. Um, there is also something called channels that I didn't go into now, which are like separate networks. You can build multiple channels of a fabric network and each channel will be like its own blockchain. So this is for people who want even more, or users who want even more uh, compartmentalizing, uh, uh, more partitioning of the state. I think they're not the most useful feature in fabric actually. Because when you want the blockchain, you put on the blockchain only the things that you should exchange, you want to exchange with others. And now we are at version 1.2 that was just released earlier in July. And now I come to where this is deployed and used. It's actually, yeah, as I said, it's the most prominent uh, enterprise blockchain technology today, probably. It's used as a blockchain as a service platform of choice on IBM's cloud, of course. So there you can get a blockchain, rent blockchain nodes, and they run this network. But of course, it's your network then. It's like your consortium on a cloud. And so as, a, as an enthusiast or a, like the crypto anarchist, you can come back and say, if it's all on one cloud, why, why is there a blockchain, yes? And I have to say, yeah, probably, yeah. There, is, there could be an adversary inside, right? <laughs> but on the other hand, there are many layers in such a system, right? Even if you had your nodes spread around different homes and companies within one country, the central adversary, that's the power supply of the country. Yeah? The one that supplies the electricity to your cycles and now to your CPUs. And now, and because all, if all of them is, are gone, then it's over, right? And the, the, the model for believing, for making the blockchain as a service on the cloud relevant is of course, well, you go a bit up from supplying ele electron cycles or ele as a cycle, uh, power cycles now you have uh, CPU cycles that you, you supply to your, your uh, workload. And of course, you again have to trust that all of them are running fine. But that's the model that apparently a lot of customers want to use. They are happy with having their own keys and nodes on a common blockchain, on a, on a common cloud platform. They don't really care so much about where this is from. But still, it doesn't mean that we are not interested in running it across multiple clouds. That's actually something that is coming at some future day, but it's not yet there in, uh, in production use. But Fabric is run on different clouds as a service, among others by Amazon, Microsoft, uh, Oracle also. They all announced blockchain platforms based on Fabric. Um, since you might be wondering what IBM does elsewhere else with, with uh, blockchain, it's actually a lot about the business as well. So as just one example here, there's a joint venture that IBM started with Maersk, the shipping company, container shipping company to track uh, shipping 
of uh, goods across the world. And the idea, of course, is to, we have the, all these silos from exporters, forwarders, ports, terminals, carriers, and so on. All these data silos should be opened up in a way and, and share the relevant information with each other. And since nobody wants to give up the data authority, that's why the blockchain comes in. This might actually be, this is a, one of the use cases that you see often proposed for blockchain technology, but it's a difficult one at the same time because these systems today are not talking to each other. Whereas in the sort of uh, exchange idea, an exchange between banks, there is already a centralized system that you can take as a specification for your blockchain solution. So in a way, it's simpler to take an existing system and distribute it as to develop a new system from scratch. But this is very much, very much ongoing. Um, yeah, I have five more minutes, I guess. Yeah, so I'll talk a bit about the blockchain platform. That's the IBM cloud deployment of this uh, technology. There is not only Hyperledger Fabric on top of the IBM cloud that supplies the CPU cycles, but also a tool called Hyperledger Composer. And with that, you can write smart contracts uh, in, a, in an easy way, in a graphical way. Yeah. So, and the, the box here at the bottom, that's, uh, what, that's a mainframe. It's called IBM Linux One. <laughs> it essentially is a way to run many different Linux uh, kernels on the same hardware with uh, superb availability. You never have to turn them off. And also with hardware security for your private keys, because you may want to secure your private keys using a hardware security module. And that is certainly something that is relevant nowadays when these coins, in theory, protect millions, yeah? So you want to protect those. That's also one of the business cases for these, for these boxes here. And there's also a technology called Secure Service Containers that is an is provides an isolation of your workload from the administrator. And that's a technology that's built into the mainframe hardware, which you can remotely think of like Intel SGX, and I'll talk about this in a second as well, which is a trusted execution environment where the local admin on the platform uh, has no access into the secrets. So that exists in that form as well. Yeah, so research direction, since I thought you would be interested in this too, what are we doing now? Because this is being developed, or we're developing on the one hand, and we're helping in Hyperledger project fabric development, but we're also pushing this a bit further. So one of the things we are interested in and have been doing are spareheading ways to have private data on a blockchain because there is this uh, there's this problem where if we want to have a resilient system where everybody has to agree on something being correct we still don't want to be don't want that all the data goes to everybody so how can we resolve this to some extent and then there are many technical answers to this question and one of the answers that has actually been implemented in Fabric is under the name of private data here or site DB or, or collections is essentially we have a few nodes who can see the data and all the others get just to see the hash of this data, yeah? This is a sort of a very simple way with which you can get some separation of concerns like this and keep the data confidential at some nodes who are allowed to see the data and others who will still see a hash. The security property you gain from this is that later on somebody can say, oh, but I saw this transaction, you please now show me the actual data that, that went into this transaction. And then you can at least verify whether the data was correct or not from the third party observer's view. But it's, of course, it doesn't mean there's a guarantee there was this, the same, that all the data was there. Because the, the person who computed the hash might have made up the hash in the first place. Yeah. There's, there was no proof the data was there. If you want such a proof, then you have to go to the zero knowledge protocols. And zero knowledge protocols, these are things that come out of crypto research where you get such guarantees that somebody proves to you that he did the computation right, that she had all the details, and she did not create coins out of nowhere. But this comes at cost. Implementing and them is, is tricky, and executing them is uh, more uh, costs a lot more. 
So this is zero knowledge proofs. We are looking at those under the headings of zero knowledge asset transfer and uh, also the identity mix of technology that allows you to anonymously authenticate based on credentials that you have. These are technologies that we are building in and making compatible with Fabric. Um, I'll talk a bit more about zero knowledge asset transfer as well uh, in, a, in a second, but before we do that, the third bullet point here talks about SGX. So SGX is a secure container, secure virtual, secure trusted execution engine so that you can have your program shielded from the administrator. And we have a research prototype uh, paper uh, where we experiment with how to do this in a hyperledger fabric context to run smart contracts within a shielded environment such that this would be a different way, yet another way to encapsulate privacy, uh, private data on a blockchain system. Based, of course, on the assumption of um, you trust the hardware to maintain the secrets. So let me just talk about the assets and the tokens as well. So a lot of the applications that are also ongoing are how to tokenize things, and you can tokenize everything you can see here. Um, then the actual job in the blockchain system will be to exchange these tokens for another thing. And this is very popular. If you look at the blockchain online news systems, all the ICOs, everything is tokens. Eh? And the ICOs, of course, are tokens as well. But um, just to give you an idea, and maybe, maybe many of you are aware of this, but what is a feature that we are looking for? Um, if you have such uh, accounts, um, then you have something like the UTXO model. That's the model as a scalable way to exchange uh, tokens between entities on a blockchain that was pioneered by Bitcoin. So it's the Bitcoin uh, um, programming model. Um, Without privacy, everybody sees what goes where. It's completely traceable. It has advantages and problems, of course, yeah. But if you talk about maintaining some privacy, you don't want to reveal where your money comes from because it, one of the things is that it's no longer fungible. It's no longer each mo coin is the same as another coin. So in an ideal world, and in some ways this is what uh, Zero Zcash does, you see nothing, right? You see only... Um, you see only that transactions take place. You have even no connection around uh, to whom pays to whom. And uh, this is one version of a system that we are aiming at where we would completely hide identities and transaction amounts. But based on the sort of permissioned and consortium applications we are aiming at, we are not happy we are not done with this model of completely shielding everything because this might be too much privacy for the real world. Because in the real world, um, as all the societies have some rules, what it means, and money laundering shouldn't just be made as easy as possible with a system like this. Yeah? So for this, uh, we're interested in audit feature where with specialized keys, one can go in and reveal certain transactions again and this, as you can imagine, requires another layer of crypto being put on top of those uh, other protocols. And how exactly how efficient they are and when they are finished, this is not yet done, but this is current research that we are aiming at. We have demonstrated some initial functionality of this already. Okay, that brings me to the end and to a conclusion. Blockchain is about distributing trust on the internet, over the internet. That's what uh, would be my message and there are a lot more things to come. We are also collaborating with a lot of uh, colleagues in Europe in a project called Privilege for privacy and uh, privacy enhancing cryptography in distributed ledgers. And here are some links. Um, and I think I even have some more links here about Fabric. But I guess you can put the slides online. Anyway, you'll find the same slides on my homepage later as well. Thank you. <laughs> so you talk about uh, having some entities uh, be able uh, to see the private data 
uh, to avoid the like kind of money laundering use cases. Uh, don't you think that uh, like the bad guy just won't use this coin and will use another? So that by making a backdoor, you just decrease privacy because anyway, if if I want to lend the money and I don't, but if, if I would, of course, I yeah, will not use your coin. This is uh, in this technology on the right hand side here. This comes back to the old discussion of uh, key escrow and backdoors in systems, whether this is a good thing or a bad thing, right? Um, I didn't say it's the ultimately best way to go, but it's the way that the customers that IBM talks to want to see this thing implemented. <laughs> um, so so, so in, in, the, in the sense that a system like the middle system, like in the middle, where you'd have total privacy, like in zero cash or so, where there's nothing traceable whatsoever. Um, that's something that the world isn't ready to swallow in that sense. But anyway, it isn't ready to pay for the development uh, that, that this would be there. OK, but anyway, so since you have smart contract uh, on your platform, right, uh, why could prevent me from just wrapping your coin into making something uh, private where no one has a decry the decryption key. Yeah, no, but you, the, the thing here is these are coins that you exchange, tokens that you exchange, and eventually you want to get the token out again. So yeah, this but is I, can make a, I can make a wrapper on your coin to make it private. Um, <coughs> I, think, I think that this will not satisfy the other constraints and invariants of the blockchain validation because in real life I can take a bank note and put it in an envelope and send it to you. Yeah, yeah, I cannot do this with zero, zero Zcash, or I cannot do this with, with Bitcoin. I cannot simply take the Bitcoin and send, send it to you in such a simple way, because in order to, to assign the Bitcoin to another owner key, the network has to validate something, namely that I'm not creating two such envelopes and I send you a photocopy over here. Yeah, because in Bitcoin, we don't have smart contract allowing you to do so, but uh, if we have a smart contract, like Turing complete smart contract, what will prevent us from implementing zero knowledge proof at a smart contract level and wrapping the coins the into privacy preserving coins? The problem is that the smart, contract, the smart contract that controls these coins must have a secret, which yeah. is the private key, uh, and it would, and, and the data itself, because the smart contract then runs on each everybody no, everybody's machines and nodes, and it wouldn't be possible for you to maintain the secret input for the zero knowledge proof if it runs on every Ethereum node. Otherwise it would run, this, this technology would work on Ethereum that you described. Oh yeah, it will. I, I have a friend implementing that, so I'm will. not sure if it <laughs> works so easily, yeah? <laughs> I trust him. <laughs> Somebody, somewhere has to be the private key uh, that you sign with, yeah? When you send a Bitcoin transaction, you actually, the, the private key is outside, it's off-chain. You can talk. Uh, yeah, let's talk later. <laughs> Yes. Uh, you mentioned SGX with smart contracts. Yes. Um, I mean, smart contracts, they are supposed to run on multiple nodes because you don't trust the execution on, on a single node. Exactly. With SGX, you can do attestation and you can trust that execution. Well, we wouldn't run it actually on one node only. And also Intel doesn't believe it should be run on one node only but on a group of multiple redundant nodes, because if you have only one node that has the private key to access the smart contract state, you again have a bit more, too much centralization in a sense if something catastrophic happens to this SGX box, it's gone. <laughs> so it's just for crash for torrent, right? Exactly. Yeah. What this technology does is, and we've seen in these many protocols you have, we have research systems, they reduce arbitrary behavior to uh, denial of service attacks, yeah. Because I can turn off the, the, the power or the communication for the box, for the trusted box, yeah. But there are interesting things that have to do with interactions with these trusted boxes. Think of um, crypto systems that participate in a protocol. Initially, people thought, well, the protocol just runs, right? But then when you're exposed, and they did not, const they were in, we call this um, chosen plaintext attacks. So 
sort of I give the adversary only the ability to en to to encrypt something, yeah. But in real life, the adversary can send packets to my SSL endpoint and can probe the responses that he will get, right? And this is the attack model that we have to defend against here as well. I have to think that this box with the secret inside now is in the hands of the adversary, and the adversary can send miscellaneous requests to it and see what comes out, and if he can break it, then it's, uh, it's actually easier to, to break the things like this. This is only being started to be understood more formally, these kind of interactions. And it's definitely not so easy just to say, okay, we just run the whole blockchain in a in a SGX, right? Because if you think how the, for example, all this, this Bitcoin or the, the proof of work type protocol, um, the proof of work type protocol, you have to be able to run to take a step back, yeah? You have to be able to, to just go a step back and say, okay, well, this was a fork. This is not the longest uh, execution fork. So I have to undo what I did. And if your smart contract that was in the SGX reveal the secret on here, it's, it's lost, right? And then you, the, if the actual go execution goes here, right? And if the adversary controls your box, he can fake this protocol to it. And this is not so easy to maintain. Actually, we talk about this in this, in this paper there. And yes, the ideal world is just like one box, but then when it comes to secre uh, secrecy and confidentiality, you have to look at the interaction of the box with the environment if the box holds some state, yeah. One more question? Yeah. Um, so this is not completely related to, to Fabric, uh, but maybe I can poke your knowledge on it. Um, there, there's been some recent research, I guess, uh, surrounding um, open blockchains with um, BFT. Uh, Consensus. Uh, yeah. Consensus, yeah, uh, underneath, instead of Nakamoto consensus, whatever. Uh, do you have an opinion on those approaches? Well, I guess Christian should. <laughs> he did some of that. He started that. <laughs> so, so some of the, uh, the, the initial ideas were, well, let's say we have these block creators and we let's take the last uh, 10 block creators and let's run them with a BFT protocol with F equals three and N equals three times F plus one nodes. And this is one of the ways that we have thought about for a while. Um, now we see that uh, the Ethereum guys, they have something like Casper, but it doesn't really look like this textbook that I had earlier. So it looks a bit different. So I haven't really understood what they're trying to do, that the proofs there. Where there is also a way where you take Actually, there they take stake, like amount of coins that you put on stake and that you lose if you make a mistake, a, a demonstrable mistake in the protocol, if you commit uh, a, a fraud, if you attempt to commit fraud as a protocol participant. It's an open question and it's an interesting question to look at for researchers, what are the connections between these stake-based things and the traditional consensus protocols? Because in a traditional consensus, we can just run weighted voting we have it directly, yeah? And for example, if you have the normal type of wealth, if you had the normal type of wealth distribution in a country, then you have the 100 richest guys who have 95% of all the wealth, yeah? So if the 100 richest guys run BFT, they're fine, right? Because the other 5%, they cannot do anything <laughs> to change this, right? So if, there's interesting questions to look at. So I guess uh, a counterpoint to that is the non-richest guys. Uh, so that's my worry with this kind of protocol that people are trying to do. Uh, they could see build a network to increase the number of faults and no, try no, no, to- No, 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 if you have proof of stake, you cannot see build because you vote with your money power if you stake. Uh, okay, I guess. Uh, Okay, sure. Uh, but I'm, I was thinking of a proposal in particular, which is uh, Algorand, something. That yeah, these kind of things, right? Yeah. 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 So. And but if you look at Algorand, then there is this this like lottery type thing based on stake, but then there's a round of traditional voting. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> so these are interesting things to look at today. Yeah, and there's more of the same. Mm -hmm. And now we haven't even talked about those DAG protocols. You know, there's a chain. Yeah. And the chain is a simple example of a direct acyclic graph, but if you have more than a chain, if you have uh, just any acyclic graph, 
this is the most recent wave of vo uh, this is the most recent wave yeah, of protocol most proposals. There are at least uh, four or five that, in various degrees of uh, technical sophistication, come with proofs or not. <laughs> yeah, that's the interesting research behind the scenes here that uh, we should look at as a community in the sense of my opening of uh, trying to construct arguments for why something is secure. Yeah, you're still understandable, but not on the mic. <laughs> yeah. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. Right. Um, uh, is it expected that to to uh, is, is is it likely to deploy this blockchain to to an open uh, for for everybody, not for for enterprises, but for everybody? Um, in a sense, to as a competitor to to the to, to, to the Bitcoin network or to the Ethereum network, well is it is it expected in the future or is it? No, it's not scalable. That's right. It depends. I mean, um, <laughs> among the twenty big twenty biggest validators, it is scalable, right? No, so I think. <laughs> 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 yeah. <laughs> no, I, we have to look at the picture here. So first of all, if you deploy something in, a, in an open network, there must be some kind of uh, payment mechanism or economic connection to this, because otherwise you could just have anybody who just, it's, it doesn't resist denial of service. That's the bigger problem than the scalability. Yeah? So you have to pay something for a transaction there. So we have various ideas to have the ordering service be provided by a big consortium. And there's nothing that stops you now from starting such a consortium within the 10 universities in your country or between. And they, you just run the ordering. And you let everybody deploy their workloads, but they have to charge a bit for the transactions that everybody sends through. And that's a model, a deployment model that is possible. But in principle, um, Hyperledger Fabric is the code base that you run in whatever environment that you want. I think that. IBM understands the implications, the legal implications of issuing a token on 10 IBM run service ordering service nodes too good, too well to do this and pretending like other companies do, this is now a token that's completely open, right? <laughs> so we understand this, that this would not be an open system where everybody, it's like a cryptocurrency. We could just start, start our cryptocurrency say, yeah, but they would tell them, look, this is controlled, this is permissioned, right? Because like when you have the same debates with, with, uh, with systems like, like Ripple or Stellar, for example, where there has to be some centralization from the protocol level or the protocol would not work so easily, yeah? I think in, in an open, um, open blockchain, like it is, it is right now in, in Bitcoin and mm -hmm. Ethereum, there has to be you have to give some in, uh, incenti incentives exactly. to, to the participants yes. who will do a computation and will uh, spend CPU cycles to yes. maybe to reach consensus. For, for the miners, yes. for instance, they, they get the fees and they get, and they get coins out of the, their mining power uh, to, to solve the puzzles. Uh, for, for proof of concept, proof of stake, then you, you, you are staking the, a certain amount on, in the system. So you, you expect that uh, uh, you are working uh, for the system, and rather you probably than still get a transaction fee there. Stake, you stake there. For for this system, uh, there's seemingly, if if it's an open system, worldwide, there is seemingly no no uh, incentive. No, for, okay, for, okay, for you can a, build in the incentive. You can build in, this, in the consensus. So, so the the bigger problem is the the, the consent. The bigger issue is the how the group evolves. The the group, the consensus group, right? This is the core here. What's, what's if the these, if these red ordering service nodes charge for each transaction that they order and they can also change their composition, then you are at something like what the Tendermint blockchain does already today. They have a permission protocol that's actually something like very similar to PBFD and they charge for each transaction. 
And this could be done with this technology as well, except that the charging mechanism is not built into the platform. You'd have to add this on top. But in that's, that's feasible. But then it has, you, you have to, it has to be in a protocol because um, it's, not be, it's not an application on top of, on top of it because the, 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 the nodes have to, be, have to gain some, something. Uh, no, I think, I think you, can, uh, you can put it on top. <laughs> not with the current code base, yeah? Because there's, not, there's no BFT ordering in the current um, production code base. But the goal is to have such mechanisms. Okay, um, my question is the following. I, I'm, I looked for the Appalachian fabric applied to, to supply chain mm -hmm. and also to supply chain finance also. If you look to the, um, if you pick up on this, uh, this model that you have here, where, where, where you are putting the banks, for example, in the supply chain finance, for example? Well, I think all the participants are the consortium. All the peers here yeah. should be and then this system is permissioned. And in that sense, it yeah. would require some a priori agreement on what this platform should look like. And that's where you, where you uh, settle such questions as who owns, who runs, which node, and so okay. on. Yeah. This is uh, a lot of, we, we do a lot of such discussions with potential customers. Okay. But Many of the consortiums are happy not to run the ordering and the blockchain platform themselves, unfortunately, because I think it's not the right model. <laughs> but some of them who know better, they also think that this, these core components would be run at the different institutions. Okay. But as soon as privacy constraints and concerns come in again, the picture can, be, can look again totally different. And you have to pay attention that you don't introduce a node in the middle that sees everything that becomes like a trusted intermediary. Because the ultimate solution for true distribution and privacy that requires some zero knowledge proofs. I agree. <laughs> uh, so uh, I've got a question regarding uh, channels. You did not describe and talk about them. I didn't but, talk, no. <laughs> uh, they look something like uh, analogous to Corda, I think, no? Um, I had them here. No, I'm going back here. Okay. I think uh, channels are not like in Corda. In Corda, um, there is syntax for exchanging between those different notaries. And the notary would be like one channel in Fabric. The fabric has relatively little syntax for, for this, but you could program this on top. This is something that should be developed. But when you look at the place where you have different consensus protocol instances, this is like Alison's picture of the Corda notary. This is one notary can be a group of consensus nodes, and one channel in fabric maps to one in, in principle, to one group of consensus nodes. Except in the current platform, in this implementation that I had earlier here, it's all the same cluster. <laughs> but the future versions will, will have different possibility to have different clusters. Yeah. That's in a design phase right now that is even public. I, I think everything is public because there are things that people do, in the researchers do in their minds, and then there are things that <laughs> we start to develop. And as soon as we start to develop, we put some some Jira items on, on, on some software development site and uh, things like this. Okay. <laughs>